Hey folks, Dust here doing another episode of Behind the Play, where this time I'm going to be talking about the matchup between T1 and Cloud9 on Descent during the UMG qualifiers for First Strike. Again, this is one of the maps that T1 won to qualify for the main event and also saw Cloud9 shockingly being knocked out despite the fact they were consistently placing in the top four prior to the first strike qualification process. So this is a really big game, and I'm going to highlight positives for both teams, actually, in this match. I'm going to talk about uh, some good rounds from both teams and just kind of highlight some of the most interesting rounds from this match. Again, future episodes of Behind the Play might be more concise and focus in on only maybe like two or three rounds or on particular strategies. But this one, I wanted to just kind of highlight big moments from this particular map. And I'll also be probably doing some videos just like this for some of the first strike matches as well. Doing something very similar, just kind of breaking down uh, some of the more interesting rounds and things of nature that I come across. And as rather than doing a full VOD review, which is ridiculously long, and I just don't think it's as consumable. Again, hopefully I'll get more feedback from the community and I can adjust the format of this show as it you know goes forward and as I see fit and as the community sees fit. But yeah, I want to start off by talking about this match between T1 and C9 on Ascent. I've already done uh, a video on Bind, so you can go check that out if you haven't already. And just been look out for more stuff if you enjoyed this one. Please follow, subscribe, and all that other shit. Yeah, let all the other YouTubers do. Yeah, sick. All right. So first, before we get into actually talking about rounds, we're going to talk a little bit about composition. Basically, on T1, you're seeing exactly what this team always runs. There's really nothing you know, different or, you know, crazy to really note on the T1 side of things. They're pretty much all playing agents you would expect. But one big thing that we are going to note on Cloud9 is that they are actually putting Vice on Sova instead of Breach. He was a very Breach heavy player, particularly on Ascent. And so having him on Sova is definitely a bit different. You can get a lot of information, obviously, with Sova. It can be very useful on this team. But having a Breach uh, is really, really huge i think you know his flashes just have so much utility and so not having him and, and i thought vice played breach really well on this map and i thought that cloud nine made good use of it so this is definitely an interesting change for cloud nine coming into this i think they had played maybe another a couple of matches of ascent prior to this one where vice is on sova instead of breach but uh, it was definitely a change up from what they had done over the last few months other than that everyone's pretty much playing the same agents they would normally play on this map so now we will start getting into rounds and we're going to start off by talking about a really cool aggressive piss around strat that t1 ran to kick off this game and it was really neat because what you're going to see essentially is skadoodle on jet dash up middle and just immediately get in the faces of anyone playing inside this b main area uh, from cloud and obviously t1 can't know how many people are there but they basically are hedging their bets that there's going to be someone there and that they're going to be able to overwhelm them with pressure and there's a lot of great accessory items to doing this because you also have the breach on AZK who's going to be able to put pressure through B main. So that's going to push any players that might want to go B main back into this lobby area here. And then an omen smoke actually comes here, which again, just keeps people basically inside this circle of B main. And then a paranoia can also come in diagonally through to help give, uh, you know, Scoodle even more flexibility because vision is going to be limited on players that get hit by that. And it's a pretty tight hallway that it's going to come through as people might want to try to, you know, fight Scoodle in this doorway. Paranoia comes right through that doorway to, you know, nearsight anyone who, who might be looking to challenge. And then obviously Breach can pop in flashes and such as well to further support Skadoodle. Maybe he even comes out and pushes. You obviously have Sova back here who can dart B main to get information. And then he maybe even come up behind Breach and support and just really keep the speed pressure on. So there's really uh, so much great things going off all at once with this aggressive strategy. The only thing I kind of wonder about is why there has to be a smoke here. I mean, I guess it does block vision on if anyone was in spawn trying to support against the B lobby push. But other than that, I think maybe like a smoke top middle would have been better to get Skadoodle more cover. I think maybe he, I don't know if he threw one or not. I can't actually remember. Uh, but I thought maybe that might be a little bit more utility just to kind of give a little bit more safety, I guess, or force someone to push through a smoke. And then you can have your, your omen here actually uh, tag them if they do decide to push through the smoke. And can also obviously put off shots to help out Skadoodle with anyone that's actually playing inside uh, the B link here into middle. But either way, we'll go ahead and watch it play out and then I'll describe everything. So here we go. Barriers lifted. Skadoodle dashes in. Catches the sickest timing ever, by the way, on Vice. Vice had no idea that was coming. He was looking to drone middle to get intel. Got completely blindsided. Easy kill for Ska. Smoke comes in. He's getting some cover. Now the paranoia comes flying in. Nearsighting players actually try to push through the smoke. They get caught because Mitch is nearsighted. Great maneuvering there for Skadoodle with the dash. And then they have, obviously, that push through B main as well. And they absolutely just run Cloud9 through the blender. Again, I think they caught Cloud9 completely off guard. They had no idea. People had their pants down, essentially, when Scott took that first peek in. And that was just a big statement round uh, from T1. 
again, Skadoodle, it's kind of crazy to see him doing this too because he was very much known in Counter-Strike to be a very passive opper, like more holding angles, setting up other players, kind of just holding control while, you know, more aggressive riflers kind of took point. And so to see him playing Jet, which is a very aggressive agent, and to see him doing plays like this is actually really refreshing because Skadoodle is a very smart player. Uh, and he was not really known for like crazy mechanical, like, flick shots and things like that in Counter-Strike. Again, he was more known for just being steady, being smart, holding angles, uh, setting up other people. He was very good in clutch situations, like 1vxs, or if you put him with a teammate in like a 2v3 or something like that, would usually always make the right decisions. But he's making good decisions in aggressive moments now too, which makes him a more versatile player. And it's cool to see because he's definitely a guy who could be a very heavy fragger in Counter-Strike. And, you know, it's just kind of cool seeing him really adapt more and more to Valorant and pulling off plays like this. So now I want to highlight something positive about Cloud9 here, actually, uh, on their attacking round. This is just a really good uh, mid-take and just good map control from Cloud9 through and through. You wind up seeing them actually catching some aggression from T1 over on the A side of the map and using that to really just kind of overwhelm T1 with numbers and just really good map control. So I want to, again, highlight something positive from Cloud9, despite the fact that they lost this match. So as we can see, to kick things off on a default, we are going to see that they're going to have their Killjoy kind of used to get control of B-Lobby by using turrets and different things of that nature. And one of the cool things about Mitch when he's on Killjoy is he kind of uses the turrets to take angles. He doesn't really use it to like watch flanks or, or cover, cover backsides or anything like that, which is good because now you can't even really do that with Killjoy anymore because you have to be next to your, your equipment, so you can't just place it on one side of the map to watch flanks and then go to the opposite side of the map. Uh, and he was an early adopter of this. Even before that patch came through, he was already using turrets this way where he'll just place it on a corner like this and it pushes that player off or forces them to shoot it and it allows them to swing off. And so it kind of is like a like an artificial entry fragger almost in a way because it can take an angle for you and let you set up a follow-up. So just something kind of interesting to note about Mitch's play style with turret placement with Mitch. And I've seen plenty of other players kind of pick up on, on that usage. Then, uh, you know, usually on defaults whenever... You watch this Cloud9 team play, they usually actually have Mitch kind of playing outside of the A side of the map for map control uh, or, or use him up middle to actually take aggression on catwalk and things of that nature. So to see him playing outside a, uh, B, excuse me, it's a little bit different, but obviously something that Cloud9 can do uh, to change things up, to change the pace or to just mix things up. Other than that, um, you know, Raze on, on Relics is outside B in this play, which is a normal default position for him. And then the rest are usually taking mid control or just leaning towards a direction uh, on a side of the map early uh, just to get things going. And again, they, they like to do burst plays. They like to do very aggressive plays. Um, and they like to really be able to focus on middle and cat if they are going to take things a little bit more slowly. So this is just all kind of typical stuff from Cloud9 to kick off this round, other than the fact that they have Killjoy actually playing outside B lobby, which is a little bit different. And so we'll kind of just go through this round and just kind of highlight some of the neat stuff uh, that happens here. I just really like how Cloud9 took map control, countered aggression, and just played smart. So as you can see, Skadoodle actually gets aggressive here and is going to be able to get in this corner and actually start taking a little bit of B lobby and getting a little bit of information on that side. And they also do get aggressive on A. So, I mean, you're seeing T1 be very proactive here. They're getting very aggressive on both sides of the map. They're trying to get information, maybe look for a fight, uh, you know, maybe try to get an early pick and then back off. Or, again, at the very least, deny some map control to Cloud9 Blue early and, and get information. You know, that, that's kind of the bare minimum here. And they're doing a pretty good job. You can see Cloud9 Blue are actually pretty far back all across the map. They, they don't really have much other than now they're starting to take into middle. Um, with their Omen on Shinobi, uh, putting a deep smoke there to allow him to put some pressure over towards Market. And this is great. You know, you always want to be doing this because it essentially forces any defenders that are doubling up on a site to actually respect the fact that you could threaten the defender spawn, that you can threaten Market, that you can threaten backstabs on Tree or A Heaven. And, and so it kind of forces their, their resources to kind of be pushed and pulled. And, and therefore, they can't really stack up on a, one of the choke points on the edges of the map for much longer. And because Cloud9 Blue had to play so passive throughout a lot of this round due to what uh, you know T1 were doing on, on both main lobby areas, uh, this is a really good response to get this this smoke out and to start you know putting pressure over towards market side and just getting map control and opening up options for you know mid-round plays. Now, in the midst of all this, while mid's being threatened and, and, and T1 are having to respect that, and kind of pull off of the support system from their jet inside B lobby and start putting some vision on market. They decide to go ahead and take a peek at A lobby just to kind of get something back since they're losing middle. And they actually get caught on this. Uh, damage comes in and then Tins eventually gets the kill on today's. And so this is huge. This is just like really well done from Cloud9 to take mid control, to catch some A aggression. And now they're going to follow it up here. You know, putting the boom bot through the smoke, just further making sure that no one's playing that uh, kind of doorway there uh, towards the defender spawn. 
And then you see kind of Brax want to come out here and try to take some of this mid area back. He's getting kind of uh, a little bit of help from his omen as he starts creeping up. He actually gets a great kill there onto Relics, but he, as he had the Spectre, he wants obviously to get his hands onto a Vandal, you know, understandable, but just does show a, a little bit uh, just lacking caution. And, and it causes an immediate trade back there from C9 Blue to go ahead and get mana advantage back. They then put the smoke on Defender Spawn at B to try to, you know, make sure that they have coverage on that side. And you can see that, you know, T1 thought that this was maybe even going to be an attack up Catwalk or something along those lines. I mean, certainly Tint is putting that pressure uh, over towards Tree, so he's doing a great job kind of creating presence and kind of forcing T1 to respect the fact that this could be an A attack. And now T1 kind of have to gamble because they're a man down. They've lost mid. They don't really have any information anywhere else because they lost their aggression at A lobby. And so they're basically just completely out of it now at this point. As, uh, you know, Shinobi safely put that spawn smoke over here at Defender Spawn. Going to do it again. Spike's going to get planted, and this is basically a 4v3 post plant that, you know, Cloud9 Blue are going to have no trouble winning as T1 will, is likely just going to go ahead and full save here. So just really good map control, really good response, and a uh, good round from Cloud9 Blue. Now we're going to take another look at a great round from Cloud9 Blue. This is going to be an A take through tree, mostly. Uh, with Mitch kind of being the lurk inside A main. So this is kind of more of the traditional default of Cloud9 Blue. You know, having uh, Relics over here with the race, used to Boombot other utility to put pressure on, you know, B Lobby and make sure that no one can, you know, play close and get intel on this initial doorway. It kind of forces them back into the site and kind of just, you know, play without intel unless they use some type of, you know, Sylvie utility like a drone or a recon dart to actually get intel inside the lobby area. Uh, so Relics is really good at being an aggressor on the edge of the map in defaults and, again, just creating pressure or denying information. And then, yeah, they have their Killjoy you know, on Mitch here to, again, post up turrets on this corner to, to force anyone that might be wanting to play inside this doorway to go back into the site, uh, you know, get orb for himself, perhaps. He also makes sure that no one crosses into one and gets this angle. And so, you know, just kind of playing default. And then, again, Mitch can sometimes pivot to help them actually take into tree with the turret. But in this case, he'll actually stay behind and play you know, the A lobby and kind of be like a late uh, lurk into A when needed. And then the rest are going to be taking the mid control. You know, they have Tens, their jet, who's really big for opening kills alongside, you know, Shinobi, who's going to have the, you know, the smokes and the paranoia to really help, you know, grab things and, and, and assist. Then they obviously have the drone and recon and shock darts and such on Vice on the Sova to, again, further support jet and, and company as they, you know, take mid control. And so that's what you're going to see here mostly. And they use it to, you know, create an A split essentially, but a lot of that emphasis is going to be uh, through short and into A. Uh, that direction so as we can see they use their initial smoke actually on catwalk just to make sure they get you know comfortable control of middle they put that pressure on market by putting that smoke the drone actually gets shot down immediately there from day so it doesn't really get out into middle and get too much information and at this point they have to respect the fact that it could just be another mid attack over into market though the smoke is a little bit more shallow than like a deeper smoke towards defender spawn that would normally be used for some type of market attack but you can see that they're already like entrenched here with three players on b you know they have a little bit of extra presence on this side of the map you know in comparison to previous rounds and this smoke and the fact that this drone got shot down so early from days means that they they can't really react too much they kind of just have to stay put until something else kind of tips them off on what they're up against and now we see vice using his drone very effectively here to clear so much room and take down a trap wire uh, over towards tree position now he didn't get deep over towards window but it's still enough intense will put a smoke down for cover anyway so they'll still be able to cross this territory pretty safely and at this point now there's only one defender on the a side that's going to be skadoodle uh you know the, the omen that would be helping him is having to respect the fact that there could be some type of push up this route into window to, to flank a heaven or maybe even start threatening over towards defender spawn and, and so it's basically all on skadoodle because they had three players towards b early maybe putting emphasis there on to b lobby or something along those lines or what have you and, and, and now they're just kind of really out of it uh, at this point so it just looks so good for cloud they've kind of just sliced and diced their way up uh pretty quickly here they keep the smokes down skadoodle unable to get the operator shot off there it gets caught by mitch and now this is basically a, a full a side take here from cloud nine so just a really good you know control they're, they're kind of using what they did in previous rounds when they threatened the market well uh, you know with really good mid control they kind of make t1 respect that a bit more and it kind of unlocked an ability to kind of just do something a little bit different just do a pacing change up catwalk into a uh, have a heavy heavy tree attack split they still have you know mitch kind of watching their flank over towards a main as well as being there if they needed another angle to attack into the site and uh yeah all in all just a really good round from cloud nine blue
So here's like another one of my favorite rounds actually from the match where we see Skadoodle again doing this aggressive play over at middle, but he actually gets instantly traded back. By again, we see Skadoodle do something very similar to what he did on the pistol round, but again, it gets countered. And then Vice also caught the omen that peaked off Cat. So you basically saw T1 trying to do something very similar to pistol, but they actually got hard countered. You know, Cloud9 were just prepared to handle aggression in that particular situation. So they're able to get it right back and they actually wind up with mana advantage at this point. So again, it's really good job from Cloud9 Blue mining their P's and Q's, so to speak countering aggression they have good map control they have their killjoy you know inside a lobby you know they have control of middle you know tens pressuring that with the jet uh you know even putting pressure on to market and defender spawn actually does get caught there by azk but the big play is brax he is going on a huge flank right now as you're gonna see you know cloud on find essentially an empty a bomb site now because of what took place over on the b side of the map and what took place on middle and the fact that tens put so much pressure at mid before getting caught and so everyone's coming in here they're getting the site for free uh, the door was broken, I believe. So, and that's kind of big because once the smoke fades, that's something else that Cloud9 and Blue have to worry about in a post plan situation with the spike. So that is definitely something to note. Uh, good dart there does get information on Shelby playing inside this corner. Uh, a good little fault line there actually does stun the spike planner. So they're they're calling a little bit of havoc here at the very least. They also put the cage up uh, over here in the doorway. So it kind of further masks that an A flank is coming in. And the big thing that you're going to see here is this. This is so rough for Cloud9. The fact that, you know, the turret obviously is 180 degrees, and you can see that he's actually standing this way. So as long as Sprax doesn't wide swing towards Wine, he can literally kind of just hover in this area here behind the turret, and he'll never get spotted by it. And so that means that Cloud9 probably feel pretty safe to a flank because they think they have a turret placed in this doorway that should alert them. But in reality, the way that it's placed, it was kind of used to be that peeker into the A site first kind of tactic that I've talked about that Mitch likes to do. And so it's completely crushed its ability to actually spot a flank. And Brax flanked up Cat real quick. Like, he made a decision very early on to give up A site, to walk up Catwalk, and to get this flank off on A main. And so you can see how devastating this is actually going to be. Because not only does the turret not spot him, it's going to shoot a Heaven player. It gets alerted to AZK swinging out heaven first. So this just gives Brax even more free reign to just creep around. They have literally no idea he's here. Free as hell frag on Mitch there. And then they pinch together essentially in the last player inside the site. So, you know, good job by Cloud9 Blue early in the round to counter Skadoodle's aggression and to actually get mana advantage and eventually get a three on three post plant in a site. But it's the great decision making from Brax to flank very fast and just unlucky turret placement, I guess, is like the best way to put it. Can't really call that a mistake so much, but also just smart play from Brax to not swing too wide and be alerted to it and just really help his team make a really cool retake. So this is like another really fun round that I liked from the match. And now we're going to kind of watch what really kind of kickstarts T1 starting to really take over the game here on Ascent. This is another pistol round victory from T1. They actually won both pistols this game. Of course, we already saw the Skadoodle crazy aggressive pistol on the defender side. Now we're seeing the attacking side. And this is because keep your eyes on Brax. Like what Brax is able to accomplish in this pistol round is so massive for T1. As we kind of start fast forwarding through, we can see that T1 are opening up pretty slow and steady. Like they're putting a lot of emphasis on A main. They're taking a little bit of mid control here with Skadoodle. So they have all that. Now, this is really common, by the way. This is basically T1's bread and butter default. I've seen it time and time again. We're going to see Spider on the Omen being really the one playing outside A on default for this team. Uh, sometimes he can teleport over into the closet area on the other side of the orb. Sometimes he can get on top of this wall. He, he kind of plays it a, a couple of different ways, but he very much is the guy that likes to put pressure on the main A lobby area or at least keep tabs on it. They very much like to use Brax to control B lobby with cams and, and things of that nature while the rest kind of take mid control, up cat, pressure market, whatever the you know case may be. Or if they want to lean towards one side of the map for an actual execute, obviously that can come into play as well. But in this pistol, you know... Brax is able to get into B lobby. There's no emphasis there because C9 really want to put a focus on middle and market and, and through catwalk. So they're, they're putting that emphasis on that while they let Mitch kind of anchor the A side with Killjoy. You're going to see even the boom bot coming out. Like they're really feeling, feeling pressured on mid right now. And they do get the information on Skadoodle being in that corner because of the boom bot. Paranoia comes in. They're even trying to make a play there as, as Relic tried to peek out with his teammates Paranoia to try to get a kill into middle, but they missed that opportunity. Drone gets absolutely shut down immediately by T1. That's a really good pickup on the drone there from T1 to deny Intel to Cloud9 Blue. And because all of this chaos is going on over towards middle, 
you're able to see Brax essentially just sneak in. He just waltzes into the B site eventually, as you can see here in the top corner of the map, and he actually catches this first player inside market absolutely for free. He's just going to be able to backstab here with the Frenzy in just a moment here. Gets the kill. Does it get traded out eventually? But at this point, the damage is kind of already done. Like, now all of a sudden, you're seeing them have to fall off of middle to support B because their B defense has been shattered by that backstab from Brax. So now Scoodle gets to get up and keep tabs on market. The rest get to come in the B side, and there's actually only one player in the site because the rest are still in transition to defender spawn because of how quickly they snapped off of Brax's backstab. So this was just like great reactionary Valorant from T1 to take advantage of what Brax was able to accomplish on that backstab on the B site and just overwhelm the site and make sure they get the victory. So this, you know, sets up T1 to, you know, really start getting control of the game, you know, in a big, big way uh, to set up for the victory. So now I'm going to show you the next, like, really big round that essentially starts putting this game to an end, which is a situation where we have, like, a pretty close game at this point. In fact, we have Cloud9 winning a couple of rounds here to actually start closing the gap on the scoreboard. So it looks like they're threatening maybe some type of comeback. But then we're just going to see T1, you know, slightly adjust off their default, but mostly play a default out. But just the way that they attack middle and the way they bust open the round is big, and it really just comes off of Skadoodle hitting a nasty shot on tens at cat so again very default opening round here tens decides to get aggressive off catwalk with an operator and scott just walks up and just wide swings this guy and domes him with the phantom even though tens had the angle with the operator that's such a big one and now again you're kind of forcing reactions out of cloud nine blue because they're a player down they decide to try to get a little bit aggressive here with mitch over at middle they're going to drone up catwalk here on the t1 side of things the mid aggression from mitch gets caught drone gets up gets to dart off on shinobi and, I mean, it just piles on. Like, this is a combination of Cloud9 getting caught out, really just off of a missed shot from 10s, and then just great play from T1 afterwards to respond. I mean, again, if you just kind of quickly go through this here, it really is just Ska getting 10s, Mitch getting caught, and then just good team play from T1. Again, good drone to get the dart off on Catwalk to kind of further, you know, get this push working for them on that side of things. And just obviously good fragging from Skadoodle. I mean, you can certainly point that out. There was just nothing that uh, Cloud9 could do. Just really efficient trading from T1. Really good countering of aggression. Really great initial pick on tens. Good use of utility. Just a textbook round from T1. To... And so for the final round of this video, I just want to illustrate some good map control into a B burst from T1 to close out the game. Again, this round is going to open pretty comparable to a lot of their t1 rounds when they play attacking side ascent again this is kind of just their bread and butter default with you know brax taking control of b lobby which he does pretty effectively here uh spider on omen again gets control of a lobby so no aggression is possible for cloud nine blue on the edges of the map and they're not able to get information on either edge of the map at this point they're having to rely on catching a duel inside tree or maybe something up middle to get intel you're gonna see days set up the drone here uh, through the smoke just to get information on any of the close corners up close at middle, you know, over here towards pizza, you know, getting into market, basically clearing out everything. He has full intel on everything that's going on middle except for defender spawn itself. Uh, so that's obviously really useful to have. You know, they start even putting a little bit of pressure over here towards catwalk. You see Vice trying to counter drone into middle, but he never really gets anything from that. So again, constant information denial from T1 by how good they pick up on Cloud9's utility and not really allowing it to get anything. And then, again, this round just feels so much like any other default for Cloud9 Blue. They, they don't really know what to do. Again, they weren't able to get aggressive on the periphery, so they have no intel on edges of the map. They weren't able to really get into middle and get into information. And so now they had to play standard and hope that their initial B defense can do enough to buy time for rotation. And then you just see great usage from T1. I mean, they just start plowing their way into the side, uh, just getting through sidewalk. They had this player pinned basically in the back of the site. Mitch able to get one, sure, but then Ska's immediately there to trade. They're able to get into market, get the spike down, and just play out the post plant very well. I mean, they keep these players basically choked up in defender spawn. We never really see Cloud9 Blue able to get out. You can see Shinobi trying to smoke off. Uh, over towards B main and get in, but again, just good utility usage. Hunter's Fury comes in, Aftershock, just everything keeps piling on this choke point to keep stalling Cloud9. When they finally start trying to come through, unfortunately, we didn't see it, but they just had good positioning in the post plant for Spider to just tally off, you know, three frags there very quickly with the Phantom 
and that is going to lead uh, to a victory there for T1. So again, just want to do another one of these videos to highlight some of the really cool rounds that I saw uh, in this first strike qualification process, and obviously this is a really big game to see Cloud9 denied uh, access to the main event, and to see T1 building up with this new lineup with Days and Spider, and just becoming more and more effective as a team. And, uh, you know, obviously we highlighted some positive things for Cloud9, though, in this match. You know, definitely had some things go their way, but just not enough. And, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, follow subscribe for more. Catch you next time.